opening years of World War II, the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan had dominated the battlefield and were expanding their global empires. In December 1941, the United States entered the war at a serious disadvantage. The Americans would have to design and expand combat power before they could enter into major offensive operations. The U.S. would also ally itself with the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union. Together, these allies would make multilateral decisions on where and when to apply their combined combat power. Starting on 22 December 1941 and lasting three and a half weeks, the U.S. hosted the first official meeting in Washington, D.C. with its primary ally, the U.K. Codenamed Arcadia, this was the first in a series of conferences in which the Allies would decide the direction of the war. The senior military and political leaders of both countries attended Arcadia, including President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill. These leaders faced several daunting challenges. As they looked to the east, they saw that the Soviet Union appeared to be on the verge of collapse after the Germans invaded in the summer of 1941. As 1942 began, the Arcadia members greatly feared the Germans would knock the Soviets out of the war. One of President Roosevelt's primary objectives during the first year of the war was to help the Soviets. These Russian forces have destroyed and are destroying more armed power of our enemies, troops, planes, tanks and guns than all the other United Nations put together. Viewing Western Europe, the members had observed the Germans overwhelm the French military and the British Expeditionary Force during the Battle of France. The Germans utilized combined arms operations and the mobility of mechanized and motorized forces, which became commonly referred to as Blitzkrieg or Lightning War. The victory was so decisive it significantly affected the future decisions of the Allies. The British wanted to ensure they had an advantage before once again engaging the Germans in Europe. Instead, the majority of their mechanized divisions engaged German and Italian forces in North Africa. In 1940 and 1941, the British Eighth Army fought a series of seesaw campaigns with the German Panzer Army Africa. This conflict was still raging as the Allies met at Arcadia with no clear victor in sight. Closer to North America, German U-boats dominated the Atlantic Ocean. In late 1941, the Battle of the Atlantic, which had been going on since 1939, now entered a new and extremely lethal phase, with U.S. shipping becoming legitimate targets. U-boat attacks were sinking substantial amounts of transports carrying war resources to Great Britain and the Soviet Union. The increased U-boat threat had to be overcome before U.S. forces could be transported to Europe. As if all this were not enough, the Japanese Empire was also conducting its own version of lightning war. Following the devastating blow to the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese were beginning a three-month major offensive that threatened U.S. and U.K. territories. All of these global challenges had to be dealt with, while the members of Arcadia could not immediately solve them all, they did create the foundation that would put the Allies on the path to victory. One of their foundational decisions was that the Allies would concentrate the majority of their effort on Germany first. The U.S. would only contain Japan with an economy of force effort until the Allies won in Europe. Another foundational decision was the extraordinary step of combining the U.S. and British Joint Staffs to form the Combined Chiefs of Staff. Based in Washington, D.C., the Combined Chiefs of Staff made all the major decisions of the war. Initially, the British Joint Chiefs of Staff had the most experience in conducting operations. Due to their recent defeat in France, the British wanted to set the conditions for success prior to attacking across the English Channel and directly into Europe. Field Marshal Alan Brooke, the chairman of the British Joint Chiefs, said after the war, In our minds, we felt that going across the Channel, before the condition was ripe for it, before Germany had been ripened all round, ripened by the air action, 
ripened by forcing her to spread and distribute her forces throughout Europe, ripened by the action of Russia on the far side, might have had disastrous effects on the war. As a lead up to a future invasion of the European continent, the combined chiefs agreed to attack German vulnerabilities. To accomplish this strategy, they planned to use strategic bombing, support of resistance organizations, and limited ground offensives against Axis territories on the periphery. The location that seemed to be the most vulnerable for an attack was the area the UK was currently heavily engaged in, North Africa. Thus, the combined chiefs agreed on an American invasion of Western North Africa. Originally called Gymnast, this operation would bring the Americans into the war against a seemingly inferior force, the Vichy French occupying Morocco. Later called Super Gymnast, when British troops were added to the invasion force, the operation would attempt to assist the British Eighth Army in defending Egypt, assist in defeating Panzer Army Africa, and reopen the Mediterranean to Allied shipping. When the Arcadia Conference ended in mid-January 1942, it seemed the Allies had accepted the British periphery strategy. However, two factors would disrupt this plan. The first was the continued expansion of the Japanese Empire. Although the U.S. agreed to the Germany first approach, it became evident that some forces would have to be diverted to the Pacific to check the Japanese advance. This shift forced General George C. Marshall, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, to suspend Super Gymnast indefinitely. The second was Marshall's realization that America's strategic needs did not match Britain's strategic philosophy. Logistically, the U.S. planners and builders needed to know definitively when and where to focus their efforts to create and transport its immense war machine. Operationally, Marshall wanted to follow U.S. doctrine that dictated the need to attack the enemy directly and decisively. Major General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the head of the War Plans Division, stated, We've got to go to Europe and fight and we've got to quit wasting resources all over the world. Marshall called for the Allies to conduct Operation Roundup, designed to strike directly at the Germans in 1943 and open a second front in Western Europe. Additionally, he recommended Operation Sledgehammer. This cross-channel attack would be conducted in 1942, with whatever forces were available only if the Soviet Union were close to collapse. While the British leaders had seemingly agreed to Marshall's proposed operations, the next Washington conference in June, called Argonaut, revealed the British had no intention of executing Sledgehammer, regardless of what was happening to the Soviet Union. The British Joint Chiefs cited, correctly, that the Allies simply did not have the shipping available to execute the plan. They also feared that the British would incur casualties disproportionately. Finally, the British leaders did not think Sledgehammer would draw Germans away from the Eastern Front. The Allies were now in a deadlock. Marshall was in a difficult position. President Roosevelt was getting political pressure to do something, anything, in 1942. He wanted U.S. forces to be in combat before Election Day. Since British leadership would not budge from their no Sledgehammer stance, Super Gymnast once again became the primary operation for the U.S.-U.K. alliance. The Joint Chiefs changed the name of the operation to Torch for security reasons, and this marked the official return to the British periphery strategy. Consequently, Operation Roundup would be delayed until 1944. It also received a new name, Overlord. <laughs>